People love rivers. They'll drive hundreds of miles to spend just one day on the water, sailing, fishing, relaxing. You know, there's something about it that makes you kind of forget your troubles, helps you to unwind. But there's a dark side, too. Every year, the rains come, and the, the river rises, and then come the floods. In fact, one year of exceptional rainfall, the river changed from a, a calm, slow-moving friend into a cruel, unpredictable enemy that would sweep away homes and livelihoods and make whole communities destitute. I'm standing about 50 feet above that river down there. Now, one would think that I'm uh, fairly safe, no chance of uh, getting wet, right? Well, you'd be wrong, because there's a good chance. That river has risen so high, it's overflowed the bank right here. In fact, uh, let me show you something. Now, in 1963, that river rose that high, right up to my knees. 1930, up to here. On these dates, up that high. 1933, then 1948, it was way over my head. Then we go up to 1913. That was a disaster year. Many, many lives were lost. But then, in 1937, it rose to the unbelievable height of 80 feet. The Ohio River travels a 1,000 miles from its source near Pittsburgh to its junction with the Mississippi, and along that 1,000 miles, there are 75 tributaries feeding into it. Most years, after the winter snow and rains, you can guarantee that it will flood. And when on January the 2nd, 1937, the rain began to fall without stopping, it looked a certainty. But in those first few days, nobody could imagine that this would be the worst disaster the Ohio Valley had ever seen. They thought it was just another flood. I'd call up on the R, and Grandma, of course, was still here, and I'd say, Grandma, where is the water now? Is it up to the peach tree yet? In the backyard, Grandma would say, no. I said, how far? Oh, it's a good piece from the peach tree yet. I said, okay. And call the next R, call up, Grandma, how far is it? Is it up to the peach tree yet? It's almost up to the peach tree. <laughs> and I said to everybody in the office, would say, how far is the flood? Across the street that I could see, there was a, a furniture store. It was Maddox's furniture store, and I would watch the letters disappear because it was a slight incline, and so as the water came up, little parts of the letters would go, and I'd say, well, there goes the A. The tributaries filled, overflowed, and yet still continued to pour into the main river. The rain that would at one time have been absorbed by the earth now fell on concrete and paving where the fields had been built over. There was nowhere for it to run but into the drains which carried it to the already swollen river. During the month of January, we had roughly the equivalent of six months rain in one month. But I think we had rain on, I think about 35 days. Now that doesn't mean it rained constantly. But I think on about 35 or so consecutive days, we did have rainfall. No conventional means of prediction could tell the people of the Ohio Valley what to expect. But I was taught by my grandfather that if you see a clear line of fog above the water along the Ohio River for two or three miles, uh, you can just bet your bottom dollar that that river is going to go to that fog line and it'll do it within 14 days. In the case of the 37 flood, I noticed the fog line, and it was up in the eaves on some houses across the river. And in less than two weeks, those houses were gone. Back in those days, we would try, based on what was coming down the river and the rainfall up the river, we would try to forecast, to predict the stage to expect. But it finally got, in the last few days before it did crash, that we just say, well, we just don't know. We had no idea, no time in history, had the water ever gone to the second floor in this house. On Monday, January the 18th, the river passed its normal flood level and continued to rise six inches an hour. The rain still fell, and the first Red Cross headquarters were set up. In rural areas, deputy sheriffs were organizing aid. 
the flood still wasn't front page news. No, the exciting stories of the day were Howard Hughes' transcontinental flight and Mrs. Simpson's marriage to the Duke of Windsor. But by the end of the week, that had changed. The headlines were telling of villages isolated, bridges down, highways and railroads closed. But the river people had lived through floods before, and many of them saw no reason to leave home for this one. They would not move unless you just almost forced them out. I've seen people even chop a hole in the roof of their building. They'd go on out through the first floor and up into the attic, and you'd even find them sitting up on a roof where they'd cut a hole in the roof and still sitting with their house. There was times that they, they'd get pretty rough. They'd want to fight if you attempted to move them. And you knew full well that uh, it wasn't going to be very long until that whole house was going to going to go. This uh, was our home here on what was the fine lot that we lived on. We anchored to the tree there. And as the flood came up, why we moved from the first floor to the second floor, and second floor to the third floor, and the third floor to the attic. And from there, we went out the attic in a sunroof. And when the waters recited, why we came back to a vacant lot. They made everybody get out except the lady next door wouldn't get out, and she got pneumonia and nearly died. Still, the rain fell, and the river kept rising. In the big cities, Coast Guard boats were patrolling the streets. Federal troops and police were sent in from neighboring areas. The state militia was mobilized, along with every volunteer organization, as city after city closed down its shops and offices. The business of the day was rescued. My father and my brother finally come down the street, walking on the opposite side of the street, and that's as far as they could come without a boat, and they started screaming across the street, we'll get you out, we'll get you out. And I said, what? We'll get you out. We'll, we're going to take you out. Out, okay, I thought. And they brought a man with a skiff in through some way, out through the alley and up through our yard and under our porch. And then he walked across with my mother and he said, let's go, the current is swift. He said, I tell you, it's swift. It was tremendous current. Even when we were taken out, I'm telling you, that boy was really bending back on those oars trying to get from our alley gate, which is halfway up the block, to the corner and to come up that hill. I remember being frightened one, um, one moment. I was sleeping in my mother's lap and there was a lady who really had must, must have come down from the hills about two months before because she had a very thick accent. And she said, uh, she said, I'll tell you something, Miss Clooney. She said, that water's going over that damn hill. Local radio stations were directing doctors and relief workers, broadcasting requests for medical supplies and pinpointing maroon survivors. For one young broadcaster in Louisville, it meant an eight-day spell without interruption at the radio station. Foster Brooks. Someone suggested to us that we stay there because they were going to stay on the air rather late. And we thought maybe one or two o'clock in the morning where normally they signed off at 12. And, uh, but we just kept going, going, going. And we were sending out messages between programs. We'd come on with a 15-minute uh, um, resume of what had happened in the flood, how the water was seeping up and coming up higher and higher. And then we'd say, uh, incidentally, someone needs some help. We understand uh, that someone needs some help in a house in Portland. There's an elderly lady ill. She can't get out. We'd appreciate anyone who could help at this address to go there and help the lady out. Soon, Foster Brooks found himself personally involved in the disaster. I read an, uh, a bulletin where someone needed a boat on 23rd Street near Broadway. And then the next bulletin I read was someone needed a bowl on 21st Street. That put 22nd Street in the middle. It had to get to 22nd before it got to 21st. And that's where my mother and dad and a brother who was very ill at the time happened to be. Well, I, that, my hair stood on end. I couldn't imagine the water getting to 22nd and Broadway. In those days, you were not allowed to give um, a direct message over radio. And I went back and talked to Mr. Barry Bingham, who was the publisher of the paper, 
And I said, look, my, my mother and dad, I don't know what kind of help they may need. And my brother, you know how ill he is, can't be moved uh, even to a hospital. He's so sick. And uh, I said, I don't know. I, I, I'd have to know something about them. And I know that I'm not supposed to give any messages, straight uh, direct messages on the microphone. And uh, Mr. Bingham said, you go in there and say anything you want to to find out about your parents and your your brother. Well, I went in and I said, Mom, Dad, I, I didn't know that this water was getting where, where it apparently is. Uh, would you please let me know uh, what your situation is about Scott and this, that, and the other, you know. Immediately, I got a call and I said they were waiting for a, a government uh, boat. The Brooks family was picked up. And it's estimated that 54,000 people were rescued by patrol boats during this time. Jeffersonville, Indiana was almost completely underwater. By Sunday, January the 24th, there were 36,000 people homeless in Evansville, Indiana. In Cincinnati, things were worse. There were 60,000. In Louisville, Kentucky, the figure was 230,000. About three quarters of the population had been flooded out. The Red Cross and volunteers settled the refugees into churches and schools once they had been moved. They came with one of these big uh, tractor trailer jobs, moving vans, what it was. Made everybody get in that. They had to file in and stand with their face to the door of the truck. Just one right after the other. We were solid in there, just like cattle. And I had my little sister and held her up. It, you know, it smothered you when you was real sharp. They eventually were uh, evacuated in boxcars, where they were loaded out at the old quartermaster depot, a hundred to a boxcar, and they stayed in the cars overnight. And then were taken up along the Pennsylvania line between here and Indianapolis. And they would ask each community how many refugees they could take care of. And they would set up emergency facilities for eating and sleeping in the armory or a high school gym. Bathing facilities was done in the big stationary tub. The Red Cross fed the people up there. Uh, everybody pitched in. Uh, we left there after several months and went into a one-room flat. And actually, we used for tables and chairs orange crates we sat on. and. Everybody was in the same boat together. It was wall-to-wall -wall people. We had two cots per family with seven children then, mother and daddy. And that's how you had to sleep. It isn't the Ritz to sleep on an army cot. And that's what we had. They gave the typhoid shots. And I think the Red Cross prepared the meals. We had our canteen who cooked and served three meals a day, was headed by a doctor's wife here, whom I know never cooked her own meals, but she had a group of her friends, and they ran that canteen for the whole time. And I'll never forget that meal that night, I tell you, it was the best meal I ever ate. <laughs> we had all gratin potatoes, best potatoes, <laughs> and kale greens with big hunk of fat bacon in it, <laughs> and cornbread. And I don't remember any meat, but boy, that was so good. There was virtually no looting, but the emergency called for methods of food distribution that were sometimes unorthodox. We found a carload of soup beans and a carload of potatoes. We broke the seal on the car, opened it up, and every day we'd go back and load the little boat with potatoes and beans and just give them to anybody that needed them. A lot of the stores downtown that the water got in, they had groceries stored upstairs. And we'd go down and go through the window and go in there. And we had to wade in water about 18 inches deep on Spring Street to get what groceries you could out of there, canned stuff that they had stored in the upstairs. A lot of people shared their foods, like the big grocery houses, the wholesale houses and so forth. They emptied their warehouses, whatever they had, everybody could have. The governor's mansion was far enough above the river and far enough away from the backed up sewers that we had the gas and we had, of course, the big institutional stoves. So we just threw it open to that whole end of town 
And people not only came in and boiled their water for drinking, but they came in and tried to do their cooking. And, and they appreciated it. I often said that uh, the first time we had complete integration in this community was during the 1937 flood. In the east end of the city, the majority of the wealthier whites live. That happened to be the higher lands of the city, and they call it Highland. A great number of blacks were taken to the homes there, uh, taken to the schools, the clubs, and churches, and this sort of thing. Fallen electric cables caused fires in many cities along the river. A vast concentration of gasoline storage tanks were an additional threat to Cincinnati. All of those tanks were filled completely full, and the water kept getting higher and higher, and suddenly you have a two million gallon tank of gasoline floating and trying to go down the river all in one bunch, and knowing full well that it was going to hit one of those bridges. It could have very easily just burned up the whole city because the water out of the main river was flowing back in through open windows in buildings and so forth. There wasn't anything to do with those tanks except pump water in them and sink those tanks and let the gasoline go down the river in about a four-inch stream. It's better to have a four-inch stream of gasoline burning than it is two million gallons all at one time. Many of the houses in the flooded areas were wooden at any moment they could be swept away. The uh, space between the tops of the windows and the tops of the doors was practically airtight. And as the water continued to rise on the outside, the airspace would be pocketed in between the tops of the windows and doors and the ceiling. And as it rose, the, it would become more and more buoyant and it would lift the house off of its foundation. The minute it would be lifted off of its foundation, then the roof was the heaviest part of the house. It would turn over on its side. It was on January the 26th that the flood gauge in Cincinnati showed 80 feet. In places, the river was seven miles wide where the flood had reached its crest. It took nearly a week for the level to drop to 70 feet, the previous record. And as it fell, the task of clearing up began. It was at the time of the Depression, so there was no shortage of labor. And my father come in this house, three inches of mud on this floor, an inch and a half on the one above, and he had to clean it all out. Everything was wet, and he tells me that the wainscoting had dead fish even behind it. They had to stink in here yet besides. And, uh, and they shoveled all this dirt out and come in here with a stove, cast iron stove they brought in, and he'd haul it from one room to the other trying to dry it out a little bit at a time. The smell was, uh, uh, was something that, uh, that I could recognize because when the water would, uh, would rise every spring and then recede, you'd, you'd have fresh mud, you know, and the kind of the residue of it, and so that smell was there. But this was uh, just devastation. It smelled musty and uh, just not good at all. And when we moved back in the house, we lived in it two or three weeks before the doors had closed, before they dried out enough to close. Hardly anyone had flood insurance. At every level of society, people lost their most treasured possessions. A friend of mine who ran a clothing store uh, had two daughters. And he lived just uh, about two blocks from my house, and he had bought his daughters a uh, baby grand piano for Christmas. And he had paid $1,400 for it. Now, $1,400 in the Depression was quite a price. And he told me that a month from the date that he gave it to him, he saw the water go over the top of it, you know. <laughs> we came back to nothing, absolutely nothing but a vacant lot. Our home was never found. There were other homes that moved away and flowed away, and you found them in different places, but our home never turned up anywhere around. So we just had to start all over from scratch with nothing but the clothes on our back. There have been other floods since 1937, but none as bad. The United States Army Corps of Engineers, who are responsible for all of the flood control programs developed since 1937, have constructed 72 flood control dams on the Ohio's tributaries. The idea of these dams is to hold the water from the tributaries and then 
let it out slowly when the swollen lower river has cleared. The entire system is run from an operations room in Cincinnati, where the weather is monitored and the water level in dams and rivers is checked and recorded. They can forecast the emergency situations which might develop from any variation of conditions. When flooding is imminent, the room is manned 24 hours a day as an emergency station directing the strategy of flood control. The Corps of Engineers is not looking back on the 37 flood as a one-time thing that could never be repeated. They know the river will rise again, and they're prepared for it. Where the river can't be prevented from rising, the engineers have built massive earth banks, levees to contain it. There are 2,700 feet of them in the Louisville district alone. And high above the river banks, they've built walls, hundreds of yards of concrete flood wall. Some river people still prefer to live along the banks, although they know that their homes may be sacrificed in times of flood. Access to these homes is through gateways. When the river reaches a critical level and the weather indicates that it will continue rising, the gates are closed. Every year they're tested, like this one at Jeffersonville, Indiana. There will always be flooding on the Ohio. It's that kind of river. But opinions differ on how bad it will be next time. With all of the efforts that have been put forth at this time, if we had everything equal in the amount of rainfall and so forth, our flood control dams and what flood control projects that we have completed I don't believe would lower the 37 flood more than six feet at this time. We built this flood wall 10 feet higher than any known crest before, and I don't see how they could ever have this set of circumstances happen again, because that rain 40 days, and the Mississippi must have backed up, and all the snow and everything that was in the mountains had to come down, and it just got here in Louisville at the right time. If it could have spread out a little bit, we wouldn't have had all that water here. You know, this is uh, Churchill Downs, where every year during the month of May, they run the Kentucky Derby. Now, it may seem strange that we'd uh, pick a famous racetrack as a symbol of a people's will to survive, their refusal to accept defeat. But in February of 1937, this whole place, believe it or not, was a sea of mud. And for the first time, people thought, well, you know, maybe the Derby will not be run. Well, you know, it was. Which was, uh, well, I'd say it was a tribute to the spirit of the people of the Ohio Valley. You see, they sort of picked themselves up and, uh, really out of the devastation and the rubble rebuilt their lives. You uh, can't stop the river from flooding. Nope. That's nature. But you can learn from the past. That's human nature. <laughs>